Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Good morning. Welcome to Bethany. It is the third Sunday of Easter. Now, Easter eggs are not just for Easter weekend. Uh, Easter eggs are these little things that are tucked throughout literature uh, in uh, contemporary culture, films, or even games. And once you discover them and open them up, so to speak, uh, what you find is a deeper, more expansive view uh, and a greater truth. And Peter, in his first letter, tucked a bunch of Easter eggs, so to speak, throughout the text for Christians who are going through trying times. We're going to be discovering them together the remainder of this season. We're so glad you're with us today at Bethany. Before we begin worship, I'm going to invite our congregational president, Joey Cerule, forward. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. My name is Joey Sarul, and I reside as the president of Bethany Lutheran Church Council. I stand before you here this morning to bring you some clarity and some insight into the future of Bethany Lutheran. I want to start by talking about the prefix try, not T-R-Y, but T-R-I, meaning three. When we hear that word, many of us think about triune or trinity, meaning God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We also have a mission statement and a blueprint that gives us a roadmap of who and what we are. We at Bethany Lutheran stand as one, being gathered, connected, and sent. And just recently, we are now three places, Bethany Lutheran, The Gathering, and Holy Cross, encompassed into one congregation. We can now always relate back to three when we're thinking about everything that God has given us. Our triune God has given us three places of worship and led our staff to create mission and purpose in three words, gathered, connected, and sent, all through our beloved triune God. With these wonderful blessings given to us, we now turn our attention into some internal governance and policies that we'll need to put into place with our mergers, mission statements, and constitutions. There are three things that I bring to you this morning. The first is a special committee that I have formed called the President's Advisory Committee. It's made up of the current president and the past four presidents of the congregation, who are Bob Lang, Jeremy O'Connor, Josette Utke, and John Holmquist. I cannot thank them enough for their time, energy, and mentorship during this time. They are instrumental in helping to cast and create the vision for Bethany Lutheran. The second update, which is for all of you here, is our church council will be working on a motion to bring to voters about our governance, policy, and constitution. We're asking for members to mark their calendars and attend the meeting on May 7th. The time will be slightly later than normal as our Rooted program will be finishing up that afternoon. So if you are in Rooted already, stay for the meeting as you're already here. There'll be information in the chimes and the Bethany Bullet, so please look for that. The third thing that I ask is that all of you can help us which is basically asking for your prayers. The power of lifting our voices to the Lord and asking for clarity, peace, and understanding is so important right now. We know that God listens to us. We want to ask him to be with us and show us what he has planned for Bethany Lutheran and his kingdom. Thank you. At this time, would you please rise and face the cross for our opening prayer.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Will you join me as we do confess our sin and receive God's grace and mercy in Christ Jesus. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and for we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, Increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father has had mercy on us and has given his only son to die for us. For his sake he forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this Lord unto us all. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. You may be seated.
The first scripture reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 and 36 through 41. Then Peter stood up with the eleven apostles. All the people of Israel should know beyond a doubt that God made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were deeply upset. They asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter answered them, all of you must turn to God and change the way you think and act. And each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven. Well, then you'll receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. And this promise belongs to you and your children and to anyone who's far away. It belongs to everyone who worships the Lord our God. Peter said much more to warn them. He urged, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted Peter were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to this group. The second scripture reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. So if you call God your Father, live your time as temporary residents on earth in fear. He's the God who judges all people by what they've done, and he doesn't have favorites. Realize that you weren't set free from the worthless life handed down to you from your ancestors by a payment of silver or gold which can be destroyed. Rather, the payment that freed you was the precious blood of Christ, the lamb with no defects or imperfections. He's the lamb who was known long ago before the world existed. But for your good, he became publicly known in the last period of time. And through him, you believe in God who brought Christ back to life and gave him glory. So your faith and your hope are in God. Love each other with a warm love that comes from the heart. After all, you've purified yourself by obeying the truth, and as a result, you have a sincere love for each other. You have been born again, not from a seed that can be destroyed, but through God's everlasting word that can't be destroyed. And that's why scripture says, all people are like grass and all their beauty is like a flower of the field. The grass dries up, the flower drops off, but the word of the Lord, that lasts forever. This word is the good news that was told to you. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to invite forward all children for the children's message. Hello. Happy Sunday. Are you guys up bright and early? <laughs> Welcome. Hello, guys. Are we all doing good today? Yes. Pretty quiet to be sounding good. <laughs> Go ahead and find a seat up here with me, guys. I still got a few more friends coming, so let's give them a few seconds. All righty, guys. I have a question for you. How many of you know what this fun object I'm holding is. Pedals? Mm. Paddles. This is actually just one really big paddle. Do you want to see how it goes together? It goes together just like this. It's pretty cool, huh? See, this is actually my paddle. One of my favorite things in the whole world to do is go kayaking. And when I'm in my kayak, I need this paddle. So when I'm in the water, I need to be able to do this, to be able to push and go forward. 
A paddle is something that I need to be able to use. Without a paddle, would I be able to move in my kayak? I wouldn't be able to go anywhere. You're right, I'd just be floating. I'd just be drifting hopelessly wherever the waves or ocean took me. See, the ocean is my favorite place to go, but that makes it hard sometimes. But with this paddle, as long as I have it, I know that I have a direction that I know I'll be able to move in. And with this paddle, I know that I have hope that I can get where I'm going. You see, that hope is kind of the same as a paddle. Paddle gives me direction. It's something I can trust in and rely on to get me where I want to go. The same way that I have hope to be able to trust in God and know what Jesus did for me. In that kind of same way, the Bible verse that we're reading about today and even what all the adults in here are going to learn in the sermon is all about that hope. That hope is super important because it tells us what we can trust in and more importantly, who we can trust in. God, Jesus, and for what he did for us. So when we look at a paddle, we can remember how it gives us direction and it's something we can trust in, put our hope in, and use to get where we wanna go. The same way that we use our hope and put the trust that we have in God and Jesus. Can you guys please pray with me? Go ahead and repeat after me, okay? Go ahead and close your eyes and fold your hands and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for giving us hope. Help remind us that it gives us direction and to put that hope in you is what we need to always remember. In your name, amen. All right, guys, if you are in the under 18 that wants to come and do a Bible study with me, you guys can join me in the back with the rest of my team, okay? The Holy Gospel for the third Sunday of Easter is from Luke's Gospel, a portion of the 24th chapter. I invite you to stand. The first verses of chapter 24, Luke is explaining some of the events that took place on that first Easter. The text continues with these words. On that same day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village called Emmaus. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were talking, Jesus approached them and began walking with them. Although they saw him, they didn't recognize him. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing? They stopped and looked very sad. One of them, Cleopas, replied, Are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened recently? What happened? He asked. They said to him, We were discussing what happened to Jesus from Nazareth. He was a powerful prophet in what he did and said in the sight of God and all the people. Our chief priests and rulers had him condemned to death and crucified. We were hoping that he was the one who would free Israel. What's more, this is now the third day since everything happened. Some of the women from our group startled us. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They told us they had seen angels who said that he is alive. Some of our men went to the tomb and found it empty, as the women had said, but they didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are! You are so slow to believe everything the prophets said. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer those things and enter into his glory? Then Jesus began with Moses' teachings and the prophets to explain to them what was said about him throughout the scriptures. When they came near the village where they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. They urged him, stay with us. It's getting late and the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. While he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it 
he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. He vanished from their sight. They said to each other, weren't we excited when he talked with us on the road and opened the meaning of the scriptures to us? At same hour, they went back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 apostles and those who were with them gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has really come back to life and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples told what had happened on the road and how they recognized Jesus when he broke the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. That too should not just be an Easter Sunday thing. It's an everyday truth. It's an everyday reality. In December of 1875, there was a passenger ship named the Deutschland, and it ran aground off the coast of England and sank. And there were five Catholic nuns on board, and they were among the many casualties that cold December night. The ship was on her way from Germany to New York, swinging past England along the way, and the nuns were on board because they had been asked to leave Germany. They, it seems, were caught in the middle of one of those religious and political conflicts that was going on in Europe at the time. This was one of those conflicts between the German government and the Roman Catholic Church fighting for power. But living in England at the time of the shipwreck was a Catholic priest and a well-known poet of his day. His name was Gerard Manley Hopkins, and he wanted to write a poem to commemorate the tragedy, and especially he wanted to write a poem that would uplift and elevate and memorialize the nuns that were on board. He thought of them, after all, as, as his colleagues, and he titled his poem, 
The Wreck of the Deutschland, a very simple title, but for him this was a very long poem, the longest poem that he wrote in his entire career. 35 stanzas long, 280 lines long, but somewhere near the middle of that poem, Hopkins included two brief lines, which very creatively and artistically attributed great honor to the nuns, and much to our surprise, also blamed, of all people, Martin Luther for the entire tragedy, for the entire series of events which led up to the tragedy. He referred to the nuns with the word lily, and in Roman Catholic thinking at the time, the lily represented purity, in fact, the purity of the Virgin Mary. That's how he classified the nuns. But Martin Luther, he called Martin Luther the beast of the waste wood referring to the kind of wood that would have been left floating in the water after the shipwreck or any other kind of wood that no longer had any use at all. Now, casual students of this poem are, are quick to recognize this comparison, this very creative and quick comparison between Luther and the nuns. But those who have studied it more deeply have discovered another little jab that Hopkins put in his poem you see, the lily was also the official flower of the order of nuns that Kitty Luther belonged to before she married Martin Luther. So when she left that order of nuns, she sort of joined Martin Luther in this whole thing. So in those two lines, Hopkins was very creative, and he, he really only used a few words to indeed honor those nuns and blame Martin Luther and then even wrap Kitty Luther into the whole tragedy. Now, of course, I personally don't blame Luther or his wife for the tragedy at all, but I do respect the way Hopkins embedded those details into those two little lines. Like I said, a casual reader is quick to see it, but with a little bit more hunting, a, a poetry geek and a history geek can find that deeper meaning. And by now, you've probably realized that what Hopkins did in those two little lines, embedding a deeper hidden treasure, is what we call an Easter egg. Now, as far as I can tell, we first started using that term Easter egg in the 1980s based on a video game that had a little hidden treasure in it in an Easter egg room. But the truth is, artistic, creative types of people have been embedding Easter eggs all along. And that, finally then, brings us to the connection to our epistle reading this morning. After all, God, whose words we read in Scripture, is the original creative artistic type, is he not? So in this letter to first century Christians, Peter, who was eloquently speaking the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter is writing a letter to Christians who lived in the Roman Empire under Emperor Nero. Now we know from history that Christians in that little corner of the world were already beginning to experience some forms of persecution. And if you lived in that day and time, you didn't have to be a pessimist to look around and say, gee, I, I think things might get a little bit worse. Pastor Kyle is gonna talk a lot next week about all of that persecution, but it's into that setting that Peter makes sure to anchor everything he says on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He is risen. He is risen now, Peter didn't say it that way, but he did remind his readers that their faith was anchored in this statement. God brought Christ back to life and gave him glory. And brothers and sisters, that statement is where our faith is anchored too. On account of our faith in Jesus Christ, him crucified, him resurrected, and him glorified, we have obtained the sure promise of eternal life in paradise with God eternally. This is the same God who created us and artistically recreated us as well. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's the all important and all true message of Easter. And I don't think we can say it too often or on too many different days of our lives, but it's not the Easter egg that we're hunting for this morning. Near the middle of our reading, Peter reminded us that our faith and our hope are in God. 
And that's the Easter egg. The, the hope that comes along with our faith, that's the Easter egg we're hunting this morning. And in our reading, Peter is inviting us to live and to live appropriately in that hope. But before we get to that part of it, let's first answer the question, what is this hope that he is talking about? What is Christian hope? We use that word hope a lot in our everyday language, don't we? Sometimes, if we hear that someone isn't feeling well, we say, oh, I, I hope you feel better. And those are good, encouraging words to say, and they're good, encouraging words to hear. But Peter is writing more than mere encouraging words. And Peter has in mind something more than simple positive thinking. Again, like encouraging words, positive thinking has some purpose in our life and has a good place in our life. Setting goals, laying down a blueprint and a roadmap, visualizing success, this is all good. Athletes do it, business leaders do it, even the congregation here is doing that. Visualizing what it's like to do ministry five, 10, 15, even 20 years down the road. That's a healthy thing. But the hope that Peter writes about involves, I think, even a little bit more than that, a little bit more than visualizing a positive future. We saw something close to the hope that Peter talks about in the news this week. It's well and good to plan and build the world's most powerful rocket, but you have to face the possibility that it might explode into a big ball of fire, too. And on a more serious note, we saw that in people like James Stockdale or Viktor Frankl. Maybe you've heard of these men. Stockdale spent more than seven years in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam. And Viktor Frankl spent three years in Nazi concentration camps, and they both, they both survived those experiences. But both of them observed that mere positive thinking wasn't what got them through. In fact, both of them also observed that positive thinking alone actually hindered human survival. In a sort of an odd sort of observation, they both noticed that prisoner death rates increased after major holidays. It seems that some of the people in the camps would tell themselves that they would be released by Christmas or by some other big day in their life. And this positive thought helped them endure some of the more difficult days in camp. But when those big days came, when Christmas came and went and the prisoners weren't freed, these people faded and died. Simple positive thinking isn't really what hope is about. Now, both of these men also observed that positive thinking was part of their survival strategy, but they also said that they faced with honesty the reality of their daily lives. They put those two things together. They visualized, yes, and they even hoped for freedom, but they didn't ground their hope in something imaginary. They didn't pretend. They didn't ignore the reality that they might not have outlived their current situation. And that gets us very close to the hope that Peter is talking about, the hope that the entire Bible talks about for us. For, for the Christian, our hope is anchored in two realities, realities that we experience simultaneously in our daily lives. Jesus did rise from the dead, and that reality brings us that certainty of, e of an eternal and positive future. But faith in that reality also produces us in us the ability to face the truth of this other reality, the reality that there will still be struggles and challenges. Let's just call them problems. There are still going to be problems in our daily lives and unless Jesus returns in our lifetime, we can't ex escape those problems. Maybe our problems won't be bad as Frankel and, and Stockdale, or maybe they will, but we will encounter problems, and so will other people. No one escapes this reality. But remember, as Christians, we realize that as bad as things might get for us, they will never be as bad as they were when Jesus was hanging on the cross, when he died 
on the cross for us. And he rose from the dead. So we say, Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And he gives us new life too. And that compels us to engage with our daily lives, no matter what kind of problems we might encounter. That's our hope. So when, when Peter writes that we were set free from a worthless life handed down to us from our ancestors, what he means is that we were set free from a life of sin with no hope of forgiveness. Faith has set us free into a life of hope. And that's our hope, isn't it? A hope that's anchored in those two realities. That's our Easter egg that we unpack today. And with that in place, then, Peter does tell us how to live in that hope. And he's got a couple different things to say to us. First, he tells us that we aren't to live in a way that ignores the earthly problems. Yes, he says we are only temporary residents here on earth. We are like grass that dries up and flowers that fall to the ground. But we can't let that cause our hearts to grow cold. We can't pretend that the problems of our neighbors don't amount to a hill of beans. They do. We can't try to outlive the problems of the world rather than fix them. Instead, Peter calls us to an active and a loving life in hope. A life that doesn't merely survive, but a life that is invigorated by our faith. And a life that seeks to bring hope and faith to everyone else. On the other side of the same coin, I think Peter is also warning us to not participate in the mindless things, the mindless behaviors that bring all the problems to the world. He's inviting us to not participate in sinful things. Yes, he says, this freedom that we have can't be destroyed because it was indeed secured by the blood of the Lamb, something much more powerful than mere gold. It's something that was established for us by the Word of God. But that doesn't give us the freedom, Peter says, to do whatever it is we want to do. Yes, we have that freedom. We have that certain freedom and knowledge and hope and truth of forgiveness that we have in Christ. But we make our hope cheap if we, if we join in that madness. So Peter says, no, we have a a life that's engaged, a life that's sincere and obedient to Christ and to God for our neighbors. He's calling us to a life that is equipped with faith and hope for every good work, a life that seeks to bring faith and hope to our neighbors too. So with that in mind, I have a few last comments about Easter eggs, about these hidden little treasures. They have become, indeed, quite popular in our culture. These days, some video gamers will buy a video game simply to play the game and find all the Easter eggs. They're not really interested in winning the game as much as they're interested in finding the Easter eggs. And many of you have heard of Taylor Swift, and she recently announced on a late-night television show that she had embedded a lot of Easter eggs in a video that she released. And her fans immediately took to the internet and watched the video repeatedly. It's a great marketing ploy to put all those Easter eggs in there. And some of you, this is another, a little bit of an older reference. How many of you remember the, uh, the uh, television cartoon series called Animaniacs? Any Animaniacs fans out there? Animaniacs was a, uh, an animated series, and the creators uh, were, were very intentional about purposefully putting little quick and humorous and almost, almost uh, forgettable kind of references to pop culture. And fans of the show would spend so much time on the internet hunting for and, and posting about all these little Easter eggs that the creators of the show made another episode that invited their fans to join the please, please, please get a life foundation. And they even spelled the last please wrong just to, just to kind of egg them on a little bit. And of course, a lot of you know that Bach inserted those little letters, SDG, at the bottom of his compositions kind of an Easter egg, reminding himself and his musicians that all the glory belonged to God. 
And I've even included, because it's kind of fun, I've even included a handful of Easter eggs in this sermon this morning. Some quick references to our school's theme and some quotes from some movies that young and old people might recognize alike. Easter eggs are fun. But there's an important difference between those Easter eggs in our culture and Easter eggs the way we might think of them as Christians. You see, Easter eggs in our culture are kind of an insider thing. If you're a Taylor Swift fan, you find Easter eggs and you tell other Taylor Swift fans. If you're a gamer, you tell other gamers about the Easter eggs and how to find them. If you were an Animaniacs fan, you went online and told other Animaniacs fans about all these things you found. But the Christian Easter eggs that we're contemplating today and over the next several weeks are perhaps found by insiders, but they're meant for outsiders. They're meant for other people, too. God's greatest desire is that all people would hear the gospel and come to faith and find real hope. So one last time, real hope tells us that even if the things of this world fail, our hope, our hope is more than a positive future, but our hope in that positive future remains secure. It cannot be destroyed. But that hope also gives us the strength and, yes, the confidence, the confidence we have today to love and serve others even when the things of the world seem to be failing. I'll say it again. Our faith and our hope are anchored in Jesus and Him crucified. Amen. I invite you to join us in singing. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the light of inward shame, but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who show great love and bless for us freely you bless for us Christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead we are
I invite you to stand as you join Christians around the world confessing the hope that is ours in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered a death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Will you pray with me? We give thee but thine own and any gift we bring. All that we have is yours alone, a trust from you, our King. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the tithes and offerings that your people have brought through whatever means they have brought them. And we pray that through them you would fund and support ministry here at Bethany, that he powers and equips us to walk with you in life and to walk for you into the world with that which it so desperately needs, the hope that is found in you. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord Jesus, be with those who are hoping for successful surgery, who are hoping to recover from surgery or hoping soon to be released from rehab and go back home. Continue to provide for them and pour out your healing power upon them in accordance with your wisdom and your will. Especially today, we lift up before you Tom Mooney and Ted Pearson, Grace Hennings and Chuck Coaster, uh, Alice Doctor and Pastors, Pastors Kuzel and Kenyon, and all those who are heavy on our hearts and our minds. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord Jesus, be with those in our world who are filled with despair, whether it is because of violence and conflict in our own cities, whether it is war broken out in countries like Ukraine or the Sudan, whether it's that which is suffered in isolation or that which is suffered in public eye. Grant hope that drives out despair, the hope that is found in you, Lord, in your mercy. And dear Lord Jesus, be with our congregation in three expressions, three locations, and yet uh, bound together in one hope, that which is found in you who was taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Today, the risen Lord Jesus comes to us in his body and blood given and shed for us on the cross with the promises of hope, with the promise of forgiveness and faith and everlasting life. Uh, those who join this confession, uh, he invites to his table. Uh, if you're going to commune with us today, follow the direction of the ushers. We'll start in the balcony and work our way down. Um, and if you uh, would just like to come forward for a blessing, just do that and cross your hands as you approach. You'll receive the host, 
uh, and then the cups, and you can distribute, uh, deposit the uh, uh, cups in the baskets when finished. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and your forgiveness. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share that peace with those you're nearby. That's peace, buddy.
pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for this most precious of gifts, the gift of yourself, your body and blood given and shed for us. Through it, we pray that you would strengthen us in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another and in the joy of sharing the hope we have received with those who are so desperate for such. In your name we pray. Amen. Just a couple short announcements before we conclude worship this morning. Uh, first of all, we have a guest with us today. Uh, Salome the uh, Comfort Dog is back over there in the corner, accompanied by Lisa and Anna. Some of you know Anna as Anna McDaniel. Uh, so you can come by and say hi to the Comfort Dog team. Um, they're going to be here this week with us as well at our school. But if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that ministry, they'll be out in the courtyard. Um, a couple destinations for you to go. If you want to go to outer space, the best we can do is Vacation Bible School. But Stellar is right around the corner. Uh, and so now it's time to sign up to help out with Vacation Bible School. Trip to the Holy Land with Pastor Mark this fall. Uh, and then to go a little bit deeper, uh, we invite you to join us for our Rooted celebration, even if you've not been a part of Rooted. Uh, we're inviting those who have become new to our family here at Bethany, uh, anyone who's a part of Rooted, and anyone who's thinking about it. Uh, but we need some RSVP, so all that information is on the back of the bulletin. Uh, with that, when you leave today, make sure you greet those that you have been worshiping with and uh, come together uh, out in uh, Friendship Square for some conversation and some goodies. With that, I invite you to stand and receive the blessing and join in our closing hymn. Now the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.